Welcome to Your Partner in Success Radio, a program that values the potential of knowledge, collaboration, and growth. The show is hosted by Denise Griffiths, who is known as an intensely curious nerd in stilettos. Each Wednesday, she is joined by co-host Ben Gay III, a renowned figure in the sales world. Ben is recognized for introducing The Closers, one of the most popular and powerful sales training materials ever produced. Having been mentored by Dr. Napoleon Hill himself, Ben has gained a wealth of knowledge in sales and life. Throughout the show, Denise and Ben delve into the world of sales, entrepreneurship, and success. Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Closers Inner Circle podcast hosted by your partner in Success Radio. I am your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my co-host, Ben Gay III, we are diving into the world of sales mastery with a gem from the Closers Part 2. Now, these books, Parts 1 and 2, are widely known as the sales bibles. If you don't have them in your entrepreneurial library, I'm going to urge you to get them. So last week, we opened up on page 93 in the Closers Part 2, and that chapter was titled Study Robin Hood, which I love. And we actually covered two episodes about this topic. So yeah, be sure to go back and listen if you haven't already. So today we're talking about mastering sales resilience. Lessons from when you're hit with a two before on page 53 of the closers, part two. And this conversation really does go beyond sales tactics. In fact, it focuses on the resilience, and that's a big word for us because it's so important, required in sales. Don't give up, don't quit, keep going. And Ben sales strategies always emphasize preparation, training, and setting up for success and guiding us through those sales challenges. He compares unexpected hurdles to a two before hit, teaching the importance of readiness and skill refinement. And pay attention to that skill refinement to overcome obstacles and continuing to continue progressing in your sales journey. Good morning, Ben. It's Wednesday. We both made it. A little struggle, but we're here. <laughs> yes. Well, struggle makes it all worthwhile, but it sure is frustrating. For our listeners, we had trouble on each end connecting to the internet or e uh, whatever, or email or where our links And are. Facebook, everything. Nothing wanted yeah. to work this morning. So uh, for those of us who are technically challenged, fortunately, I had Denise on one end and Gigi on the other end, and they worked it out. So I'm grateful. I don't know what you did, and I wouldn't know how to do it again, <laughs> but I'm grateful. Leave it to the women. We yep, always yep. get it done. So thank yep. you, Gigi. I, I found that to be true. The uh, You know, I was, I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it, but I was raised with two strong women, my mother and my sister. She was seven years younger, but she thought she was my parent after she got to a certain age. She tells people frequently, yes, we were worried about Ben. <laughs> the, three, <laughs> the three of them. <laughs> so, I, I grew up around teachers, that. Your you know, female teachers have the same attitude about you? Yeah, female so. teachers, Ms. Griffin <laughs> yeah. and others have the same attitude. And then I went to work for Macy's, which back then uh, was dominated. All, most of the buyers were women. Salespeople would come up through the ranks and so on. And uh, the CEO was a man, Ross Anderson, but he acquiesced to the women. He said, Ben, they run this store. Don't mess with them. And uh, then I went into the cosmetic business, dominated by women. And so I've... Uh, just gotten very comfortable with, uh, do we have a woman around here we can ask about this or something? There's something, I don't know what it is. And at the risk of sounding sexist, at least it's complimentary sexist. You guys have a way of seeing things that most men don't have. And this man sure doesn't have. Uh, Gigi says, if I'm looking for something, you know, Gigi, where's the ketchup? Uh, instead of telling me it's in the refrigerator door, she just comes to the refrigerator. I said, you, I, why don't you just tell me that? She said, because you look like a man. You don't <laughs> look down. It, yeah, you, know, you just look at, uh, yeah, whatever is eye level is where it needs to be. That's right. If it's yeah, not there, then uh, if it's not there, then it 
it can't be uh, can't be found. So I'm I'm used to women solving things. I got no problem with yelling, Gigi, Denise needs to talk to you. <laughs> and Could somehow you, you guys right yeah, yeah, you you pulled it off. Yeah, we just, you know, put you over to the side and we took care of it. Yeah, oh yeah, I was told to go stand over on the side. <laughs> <laughs> but so. we made it but listen you know men do think differently and I had a, a podcast episode about this not too long ago and she said something to me that I kind of found shocking because I hadn't thought of it but it made perfect sense and that basically women are thinking you know in squiggly lines we're here we're there we're over we're back over oh geez we're over here now men have about three boxes one is do it don't do it the other one is blank there's nothing in there. And, I, and I'm paraphrasing. Or, or, or where's the hammer? Yeah. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. She said, no, they have blank spots where they just zone completely out. I guess that's why they watch sports. I don't know. But she <laughs> said, I don't get any of it. But she said, they, they think so differently from us that it's no wonder that marriages fail because we simply do not understand each other. Uh, having been a victim to that concept, I totally agree with you. The uh, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I can't think of his name right now, but men are Mar from Mars, women are from Venus, or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's an easy name, and I can't remember it either. Yeah, but I'm talking about John, somebody, whatever. Anyway, it's a great book. But John when Gray. I remember when I John huh? Gray. yeah, it's great. Yeah, when I read it. 20 years ago or whatever, I, I remember thinking, oh, <laughs> oh, that explains that uh, because we just think differently. That's not good or bad in either case. No, not but, at all. We but, just uh, we, we have to navigate around it or not. You know, so <laughs> <some> courts. <laughs> which, which is true in selling. You know, yeah, yeah. Selling a man, selling a woman. I get criticized from time to time. In the closers part one, we have the breakdown on how to sell to women, seniors, Jewish folks, Protestants, you know, whatever, because there are slight differences. Overwhelmingly, people are the same, but there are little differences. And if you don't know them, uh, you've got, you know, when you're selling me a roof, a guy kept saying to me the other day, because we need a roof for one of our houses. Uh, he said, and this comes with a lifetime guarantee, and this comes with a lifetime guarantee, and this comes with, I said, sir, look at me. I'm 81 years old. I don't care about it. You could, you don't have a bad roof that will, that won't outlive me. So I really don't, you, you've got to learn your customer. I wound up giving him a copy of the closers part one. I said, look in there and find the last 10 sales you missed. Because I guarantee you they're all in there written down because you don't listen. You don't understand there are differences. There's a, a, a thing in there, and I won't waste any time on it, but on um, selling to black folks in their homes, especially. And it gives an example. And several people, I thought to myself by the reaction on some faces, I don't think I'll cover that particular section in future seminars, because I could see it upset some people. And finally, a, a very nice black gentleman who I talked to as before the meeting started raised his hand and said, Mr. Gay, some of these people are offended by that story. But let me tell you, it is the absolute truth. And don't you forget it if you call on any of us in our homes. So but, there are there are truisms yeah. that are not yeah. popular to talk about. But uh, you still have to be aware of them. Yeah, you got to be aware. It, the game is being played. You brought, exactly. If you're playing tennis, bring a tennis racket. I had a thought this morning because, you know, we all have subtle or not so subtle differences depending on where we are. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm in the South. I'm in Cajun country, which is way different from anything else in the South. It's its own ecosystem. If it you, ought to be a country. It really should. A small <laughs> country. But, you know, it's, but it ha we have things that nobody else knows what the heck they mean. Like, for instance, we've got a saying. It's two syllables, but it's four words. And that's jeet yet. 
did you eat yet? Unless you've heard us talking about it, you have no idea what we just said. Yeah. Did yeah. you eat yet? G yet. It's two syllables, four words. This is not <laughs> uncommon. And that kind of goes back to what we're talking about, the differences between how you approach different people. When I'm talking to somebody from San Francisco, I don't drop into Cajun or Southernese. I just know better because they're going to go, huh? <laughs> they <look at> that <laughs> heck did you just say? Uh -huh. <laughs> because it, yeah, that's exactly right. So you have to be aware of who you're talking to and what you're bringing to the table. I frequently say to people, especially on the phone when talking to the some live agent from the Philippines, with my southern ears and your delightful accent, I'm having trouble understanding you. You have to speak slower or put someone else on the phone. No offense. I've had and, to do that. And I'll tell people, listen... I hear in Southern, slow yeah. down, please. And it may be somebody that I know well, and I'll have to my slow, slow, breathe, slow. You know? But after a while, I can't stand it anymore because I'm only hearing every third or fourth word. Exactly. My sister has a heavy Southern accent, but speaks like a machine gun. <laughs> and uh, so I have to say, Jane, slow down, slow down. I, I know this is hard for you, but pronounce each word until I get in the rhythm. After I've talked to her for about 10 minutes, I got it again. But in the in the very beginning of any conversation, I don't know what she's talking about. And again, with customers and when you're calling on them, if you have that problem, say it up front. You know, with my southern ears, with my Yankee ears, with my bad hearing, with my whatever. Uh, I'm having a little trouble here. Uh, help me out. And, right. uh, you know, acknowledge it and work around it because they can look in your eyes and see that you don't understand what's going on. There's a look we have. I was going through an airport the other day and it was a nightmare getting through security to get in the inner circle. And then it turned out I didn't I couldn't find where I was going next. It was one of the uh, lounges that you have to be a member of, et cetera. But I didn't want to go back out through security and put, you know, put myself through that again. And this nice gentleman came up to me and he said, uh, sir, you look confused. And that's what I'm here for. What are you looking for? I said, does it show? Oh, she, he says, oh, yeah, I figured next you'd start crying. Oh, he said, I could sense your frustration. I see it all day, every day. I, bet. I said, all I'm trying to do is not get out of the secure zone again and get to, I forget what it was, the Delta place or the American Airlines place, whatever. And, and he says, I get that all the time. Don't you worry about it. And he took me by the elbow, walked me around the corner. He said, I'm going to put you in the secret entrance. We went in the back door of the club which is unmarked and, and so on. I said, God, I'm putting you back in my will. I, I said, I took you out last week. I don't remember why, but I'm putting you back in. He said, I appreciate that. I'll tell my family that we're in good stead now. <laughs> we're rich. <laughs> we're rich. <laughs> Unfortunately, his credit rating might go down when he gets oh. the inheritance. But there you anyway, go. he he would, would have made a great salesperson from 25 feet away or more, he looked at me and said, this guy doesn't know where he's going. He's confused and frustrated. Let me step in and solve this problem. And I, I even told him, I said, if you ever decide to get out of this business, I will find someone wherever you want to live that will hire you. You have an empathetic personality and uh, I can put that to good use in selling. He said, well, give me your card. And I gave him the card. I haven't heard from him yet uh, but maybe i will one day Never but that's know. that's what we do we solve problems sales exactly. people solve problems and oftentimes like this gentleman if he's paying attention and he was he solved a problem that you hadn't yet articulated you just knew that it wasn't working you were unhappy you probably never wanted to go back to that place again but he was watching and in some way listening to you by watching your manners, your mannerisms rather, and he stepped up and, and helped. And that's yep. really what good salesmanship is about. It's not hammering you and say, oh, you got to buy this widget. No, I don't. 
I'm one of those people, if you tell me I have to do something, I'm out, I'm gone. Now, if you ask me if I want to do something or would like more information, sure, but don't tell me I have to do something. And that's a sales process that I find way too often. People, oh, you got to do this. You got better. Shut up. <laughs> you know, that's that's all you're going to get out of me is stop talking. <laughs> what part of shut up don't you understand? Yeah. But it's true. And there's, you know, there's persuasion, which we all use. But this guy used persuasion just by being present. So he probably yeah. saved, I don't know, maybe other people were watching it and going, huh, maybe this isn't so bad after all. He didn't just <laughs> impact you. He impacted the people who were observing, I bet. Yep. And that happens in so much of life. You're doing something and you're in the moment with the person you're talking to. And I've been alive and at this long enough that two or three years will go by and somebody might say, you don't remember me, but one day, and then they describe the situation, and this is the way you handled it, and I learned a life lesson from that. And uh, that's very fulfilling. I'm in selling for the money, but to use the cliche, that makes it all worthwhile. Sorry, I, I had muted. It does. And I read something the other day on Twitter or Facebook. I can't remember. And basically this, this woman who is an attorney, she lives in Paris. She's been on this podcast, which is why I was a pain. I was paying attention to it, but she had to quietly and respectfully remind people that attorneys are solving your problems because they get paid to do so. No, yeah. you cannot pick their brains. No, and she didn't say that, but it was implied, and it it was. I thought it was a good sales tactic. It's like, listen, I'm here. I can help, but yeah, you're going to have to pay a fee for that. I've so learned I right up, up front with it. I picked it up somewhere. I, it might have been from Rob Anspech, but somebody that we all know. Uh, used a phrase that I've used numerous times since then, you know, hi, Mr. Gay, I'd like to pick your brain. And I said, well, it, stealing from Rob or whoever it was, well, you can pick my brain right after we pick your method of payment. Oh, well, I didn't yeah. plan to pay. Okay, right. well, listen, it's it. been wonderful talking to you. <laughs> and the thing is, well, pick my brain. That's one of those phrases that just has me going, Ugh. <laughs> it just, it gives me a serious case of the willies. And the thing is, you know, those of you who are listening to us, we do a lot for no charge at all. We do everything we can to help other people. But when you are trying to get into our skill sets and have us actually work with you, pay us, just plan on it. Yeah, another example I use is like your attorney friend. I said, do you go by your attorney's office to pick their brain? Or do they want a retainer up front of some sort or whatever? And they'd be, oh, yeah, I understand that. And with salespeople, uh, you're paying for their expertise, if only by buying the product or service. Let's talk about that because there is a process and you go through it you know, multiple times in this book, but you, you know, you give your best sales presentation and then you think it's going along, it's working beautifully and the cash register is going to ring for you and it doesn't. What did you do wrong? Yeah. You know, and how can I regroup quickly if, if we're in the midst of something, I, I know I can feel it when it goes off the rails or when I've lost them or when they're confused, and a phrase I coined years ago is still true, confused minds don't buy. Among other reasons, they're trying to figure out what the solution or the answer to what they're confused about, and you're plunging on with your, with your planned presentation, unaware that you've left them back at the depot. And uh, you know, so we, we go on and we get to the end, you want the red one or the blue one? Red what? <laughs> but, you know, 
we were discussing this. You want the red one or the blue one? You lost me back when you used some trade terminology I didn't understand. And so I didn't really hear anything past that. They're not always that honest and open, but the end result is you walk away without the sale. And in the what we're talking about today, when you're hit with a two by four, a lot of that uh, is covered in that chapter starting on page 53. The example I use, uh, well, among others, but the main example in there is a friend of mine was working in the sporting goods store. And he said to the crowd, uh, I, I promise he was selling unicycles that day and demonstrating them. He said they almost killed himself getting where he could ride the unicycle so he could show how easy it was. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, he's, he's selling unicycles and he said to the group, I promise you that before you leave here today, if you're remotely interested, I'll have you riding this unicycle. So you'll see that it's a fun thing for the family and, and so and so. And he said, I got that normal look you get when people think, no, you won't, <laughs> or that's not possible. He said, come on, come on, I need a volunteer. I can teach anyone to. And a guy, uh, I, I, as best I recall the story, missing a leg. Um, he was, that's on page 54. I'm yeah. still chuckling over it. Yeah, and, and on a crutch. Right. As best I recall, uh, indicated he liked, but he couldn't see the guy, indicated he liked to learn, he liked to be a volunteer. And then the part, the crowd parts a little bit to let him through. And that's when my friend saw the crutch and the withered or missing leg or whatever it was. And he says, Oh, uh, and the guy says, What, what, are you not going to guarantee it? And he says, Well, if you're willing to try, I'm willing to try. And by that time, he's shown how it works. And that a lot a lot more people can ride a unicycle than think they can ride a unicycle. And he said, well, if you're willing to try, come on up and I'll uh, we'll get you on it. And the guy said, are you out of your mind? I would bust my rear end uh, if I tried to get on that thing. And so the sale, and my friend says, something to the effect, oh, okay, I understand. And he's backing away from the sale. He's been hit by a two by four. And the guy said, but I will buy two for my kids. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And see, this kind of goes back to, you know, the two men that sold you all those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars. Yep. They didn't go any further than what was happening right there in the moment. He almost made that same mistake. Exactly. He was done. Yeah, he told me he said I, I was literally done. He's missing a leg or whatever on a crutch. He can't buy a unicycle. Next, well, that's not true. Most of his friends have both legs. His kids probably have both legs. His wife has both legs, etc. But he gave up too quick. He got hit with a two by four and dropped his sales persona, dropped his skills got thrown off track for what he's supposed to be talking about at that moment because like a good pitchman at a carnival he's supposed to do this then this then this and get somebody out of the audience to ride around on it for a second and then ask for the order and uh, by the way i've probably mentioned this before but i love it Gigi hates when the carnival or the fair comes to town because i always insist on going not to ride the rides or eat the cotton candy I want to go to pitch row, and I hate the word pitch, but that's what they call it in the business, pitch row, where they're selling the food chopper and the dicer and the magic this and the the white the cloth wipes that clean up anything in the world and polish it and make it look new and so on. Right. Carnival I just, barkers, that's yeah, I think I've heard yeah, that. Term. Barkers. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, uh, my uh, uncle, uh, honorary uncle, Uncle Howard, was a big deal in the jukebox uh, slot machine business uh, slot machines were hidden behind a, a secret panel in a wall but he sold jukeboxes and slot machines and uh, pinball machines and so on but he st started out he was the pitch man the barker for the hell drivers and i don't know if they're still around but they used to be a, a couple of units that traveled around the country it did amazing things on cars. 
you know, got him up on two wheels and went all the way around the track at least once, uh, jumped over each other. Uh, I think there were some planned crashes as dust, I recall. But he, he was the uh, the barker for the hell drivers. You know, step right up, step right up. And uh, he used to, I never saw him in that role. He was had moved on and was a big deal in pinball machines by that time. Uh, but uh, I would say, Uncle Howard, do the hell drivers, do the hell drivers. And he would do it. And you wanted to get out your money, buy a ticket and go in to see him. We're sitting in his living room. <laughs> his, uh, his presentation was so good and so persuasive and everything you ever wanted to see and do and feel was beyond, just on the other side of that wall. And I don't think there's anything that could have ever thrown him off. You could hit him with a two by four, it wouldn't have made any difference because he knew right where he was going. Had a, uh, one that I love because she got me. Uh, we uh, were standing, we, Jimmy Rucker and I in the Coast Guard were in Atlantic City on a weekend off, I guess. And I'm listening. I said, come on, Jimmy, let's go hear the, the pitches. And uh, we're outside some auction type thing on the boardwalk. And uh, this lady, uh, this lady's up giving the presentation. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but I really don't want to go in. And then I felt a little nudge in my back. And I turned around and this lady with the oddest eyes, they look like the picture of a great white shark might have that were cold and light blue and so on. She nudged me in the back. She said, let's go in and see what they got. And I thought, I'm a Southerner. Okay. So <laughs> I, I went in because she told me. This to. could have ended so badly. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever I bought, it was for my sister. And I was going to take it back when the first leave where I got to go home. And I started looking at it. I literally can't even remember what the subject, what the product was. But it was broken or it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So Rucker said, well, you got screwed over there. And I said, no, we're here. I'm going to go down and show it to the lady. So we walked in and there's the lady who gave the presentation. And I pointed out to her and she said, well, I'm not uh, qualified or whatever, authorized to give you a president, to give you a refund. But let me get my, my owner. And she goes in the back and comes back out with the lady. Same woman. <laughs> with the blue eyes. <laughs> Now, who could have seen that coming? <laughs> I said, well, I don't believe you. it was you. You're the one that got me in here. She said, were you the kids out on the on the boardwalk? And I said, yeah. She said, you were so easy. Oh. <laughs> a little nudge in the back. Let's see what they got. Oh, but my God. Again, uh, <laughs> on on script, the presentation, that she, I didn't go out and see it, but if I had seen the lady give the presentation again, it was word for word. It was effective. And if the manager owner hadn't been handling my return, which she did graciously, uh, she'd have been out there nudging somebody in the back. You know, let's go and see what they got. So good salespeople. <laughs> You can you can have something thrown at you yeah. that you've never seen before, or a one legged one legged man who wants to learn how to ride a unicycle. But there's a way out of that. He should have said immediately, uh, "Well, do you have children? Is your wife athletic?" Right. <laughs> you know, and gone. In, it's like people say they work in a car dealership. I wasn't able to sell them a car. Why? Well, they just they don't. They didn't want to buy. And I said, did they have a car when they came? Yes. Well, then someone sold them that car. Do you figure that was the first car they ever had? Oh, well, no. Well, someone sold them those. Do you think they'll buy a car in the future? Well, sure. They're in their 40s. They'll probably buy another 10 or something. And well, then shame on you. Other people have sold them before. Other people are going to sell them in the future. The only person on the planet that we have figured out can't sell them a car is you. Now let's analyze your sales presentation. Right. And cover when you get hit by a two by four, what do you do with that? So what I'm thinking every time I come across these in your book and by watching other people, oh, I just can't close it. I can't close it. 
And my instant thinking, and I don't think I'm all that far wrong, is, well, you don't believe in it. That's you a can big factor. tell what you yeah. don't believe in, that yeah. you don't trust. And there are people who can't buy your product. That's a condition, not an right. objection. But they could in the future. The guy who sold me uh, my uh, 1962 Volkswagen uh, figured that was the end of the transaction. I turned in a 1950 Mercury when he opened it to make sure I wasn't leaving any personal possessions behind. A flood of beer cans rolled out of the trunk. <laughs> that was Jimmy Rucker, right? That wasn't you. He, Yeah, <laughs> because behind the rear seat where a speaker to a radio used to go, I guess, the speaker had been taken out. So my friends riding around drinking beer would drop their empty beer cans in that hole, which then went into the trunk. And I'd never opened the trunk, so I didn't know. So you pull up in a 1950 Mercury that's 12 years old and beat to death, and you open the trunk and all the beer cans fall out. This doesn't look like a man you could build a career on. I got that. Yeah. But he should have stayed in touch because things change. And as our regular listeners will know, and what Denise is referring to is I went on to buy uh, three years later my first new Cadillac. And then I went on to buy over the next several years, six buy and or lease 600 luxury automobiles, Stutz Bearcats, Rolls Royces, Lincolns, Cadillacs, Corvettes, mainly to give away to contest winners. But nevertheless, I bought them and I bought the vast majority of them from just two people. My friend Herc in Marin County on Marin Bay Lincoln Mercury and then a gentleman up in the area we live in now who worked at a Cadillac dealership. And both of those two recognized my potential value. It was easier to see as time went on. I probably pulled up in the Cadillac. But the guy who uh, took my 1950 Mercury's trade-in um, should have been wise enough to know this probably isn't the end of this guy. This probably is not the last car he's ever going to buy. There you so, go. There. So for him being hit by a two by four was the beer cans rolling out of the trunk. And see, I am one of those people. I have hypersonic hearing. I can hear literally. I keep my office very quiet because when I'm looking at code or I'm thinking and focusing, I don't want a bunch of extraneous noise. I can literally think, oh, you left the water on and the hose outside because I can hear it. It yep. annoys people. They're like, you heard that? Mm -hmm, I did. You want to take it back now? <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. but, but with that comes a cute sense of smell as well. And I'm thinking, I'm picturing this car in the hot sun smelling of old beer. How How did you guys not notice that? Because we had new beer. Oh, <laughs> see, this is the difference between men and women. Yeah, it's hard to tell old beer from new beer. <laughs> oh, yeah. It all smells like skunk stuff. Yeah. <laughs> see, I'm going to be wrinkling my nose for the rest of the day, just thinking of that car sitting in the hot sun, stinking like old stale beer and probably cockroaches, just so you know. Well, probably if they were agile and got up through the wheel covers and so on entirely possible the uh, by the way for those who are listening who uh, uh, might feel like they've heard some of this before they probably have because I tend to repeat stories but in addition to um, the uh, when you're hit by a two by four on page 53 be sure and reread assuming you have a book on page 153, Just Fly the Plane, Son, Just Fly the Plane. That's the most popular, except for the last chapter, Sales Infiltration. That's the most popular chapter in the book for some reason. I guess they can picture themselves there or something. But Just Fly the Plane is similar to a cousin of when you get hit by a two by four. All of it means keep your footing. Uh, remember why you're there, which is sell a product or service. And then you mentioned uh, them, uh, I forget exactly how you phrased it, but, but it was a built-in objection. 
that they hear over and over and over again. If you think, oh, they, they weren't sold on the product was what you were talking about. If salespeople believe their product is priced too high, they will hear price objections all day long. They will. Because they carry it around like tuberculosis. And, and you know, as an entrepreneurs and people, you know, service providers like me, I am a ser service provider in mm -hmm. my own way. You know, I build websites. I do social media marketing with people. That's a service. They're products and services. And I had to train myself with the help of, of the sales Bibles early on that I could not let my bias about money, and we all have it, get in the way of what my pricing structure was, what my skill set was. And if I believed that, oh, I wouldn't buy that. That's too expensive. I couldn't convince anybody at all to let me build them a website until I understood that not only were my prices fair, but I over deliver 100% of the time. Yeah. Then it got very easy because I believed in it. I no longer was looking at my own, oh, that's a lot of money. It is or well, it isn't, but if they need it, they need it. The old biblical saying, it's hard to be a prophet in your own hometown. Right. Sometimes we know too much about ourselves uh, to be effective. Uh, we know we wouldn't buy that. Well, I've sold lots of things I wouldn't buy because they don't fit my needs, my wants. You know, I'm, I, for some reason, I always go back to the oil tanker uh, thing. I could sell oil tankers, ocean going oil tankers, if I knew enough to sell them and knew who was buying them, who was in the market, I could sell them just fine. There's not a remote chance I'd buy one. No, exactly. Person. Yeah, so that really doesn't have anything to do with it. But if you're selling something you don't believe anybody should have, that they're being conned if they buy it, that's a problem, and you'll carry that around like tuberculosis. And then if if you believe it's overpriced, if you believe it's prone to breakdowns, spontaneously they'll say well, what's the record on these things do they tend to break down and you're thinking how do they know that i don't know how they know that but i'm telling you <laughs> it's those they bubbles know over your head those invisible <laughs> yeah. oh shit bubbles <laughs> we all have them <laughs> excuse the language we all have them we can read them they're out yeah. there yeah absolutely so don't whether it's uh fly the plane sun or when hit by a two by four or whatever the trick is to stay Remember what you're there for. Remember where you were. Be observant as to how it's being received and don't let them pull you off track. I was reading something just the other day. I, I think it was some group on me and I don't know, but it was a speaker talking about uh, they're up in front of 500 people talking. Uh, in my case, it could be 15,000 people as long as they're with, within my eyesight range. Everybody's laughing, giggling, and clapping, and there's one person sitting there wishing he was somewhere else with his arms crossed. That's the one I focus on. <laughs> For some reason, I can spot them anywhere. If my eyesight was good enough, I could spot them at the Rose Bowl. Uh, for some reason, I, I'm aware of them, and then uh, I don't get pulled off course, but I try to win them over. Uh, I was given a speech in London one time, and there was a, I talked to him later, a wonderful gentleman, leaning on, sitting down on the aisle with his hands up, holding his chin on top of his cane. You can picture it. And he was in his 70s or 80s, which I thought was very old at the time. <laughs> and and his Like when was, we're, we're 18 and we think, oh my God, she's 25. She looks good for her age. Yeah, and exactly. they're done that. Gigi was talking about some teacher that, she had in high school and she thought he's very nice for an old man and then looking back she discovered by by figuring it out he was probably in his late 20s what oh yeah <laughs> seriously i went to a birthday party when i was 17 and the girl was just turning 25 and i was stunned by how good she looked for her age and now i'm stunned that i was that stupid <laughs> so, <laughs> we all grow up <laughs> Well, back to my friend in London, he's leaning on the cane, his eyes are drooping, and I continued to say out of my mouth what I was supposed to be saying, but my focus had changed totally to this guy to make sure he didn't 
goes sound asleep, starts snoring. Well, it was worse. He went sound asleep and fell sideways out of his chair, oh. like that old guy on uh, Laugh In. Remember the oh. you know, guy who wore a black hat and a black coat, and he was forever falling asleep and so on. Because I think it was Tim Conway or someone like that. But anyway, my focus went to keeping him awake to the exclusion of everybody else in the room. As I said, the words continued to come out of my mouth. I knew the script, but my attention, my eye contact, my luring them in went to this one guy. And from time to time, I've been lured off by the guy with his arms crossed. Instead of going, oh, there's 500 people in the room and there's one who probably is going to buy, uh, but he might. But who cares? I have 499 others. You're not going to pull me off center uh, with your inattention. So I, I can't say I'm immune to try and win them over. I, I like to be uh, liked and effective and so on. But I don't get hit by the two by four nearly as much as I used to. And I continue to fly the plane. I wasn't going to close them all anyway. I have a 86% closing rate one-on-one, -on -one, and in groups, it's rarely that high because there's people who, you know, they, they weren't as qualified or you didn't pre-qualify as, as you might have a one-on-one -on -one situation. And there's a nasty trick that groups have. They can sneak out the door when you're signing books or doing whatever you're doing. They cannot make eye contact and go out the door because they would rather have their money still in their pocket till they're sure. So I've gotten used to, they're not all going to buy. Even one-on-one, -on -one, only 86% of my customers buy. That's 14% who listen to my sales presentation. And I figure I've given over 100,000 one-on-one presentations. That's an estimate. That means 14,000 people have listened to the wonderful Ben Gay presentation over whatever product or service I was selling and said, no, can you oh, imagine that? I can't. And I feel so <laughs> bad for you. Did that sound sincere? Because since this, I have to tell you, sincerity is extra. It costs extra. So <laughs> how did I do there? <laughs> so. I'm not paying. <laughs> oh, well, poor you. But I wanted, I wanted to go because there's a, a one thing in particular that I really wanted to cover in this <laughs> for you, <laughs> that's going to be in my head all day. Okay. So, um, but you've got, where did it go? You've got a, a five-step solution complete with a six-step escape hatch for emergencies. And you say that you'll save 90% of those situations, assuming, of course, you are selling a worthwhile product at a reasonable price to a qualified prospect prospect let's go through those we've got about 15 18 minutes do we have time uh, we have time but i'm i'm not sure that that's uh let me encourage people who have the closers part too and if not let me encourage you to get it uh to go to page 53 and what denise is talking about is laid out one two three the sixth step though the escape hatch uh it, it says if you've honestly used all of the first five steps, if you tried silence, if you tried compliments, if you tried to write your way out of the problem through sincere consultative note-taking, if you fell back on your standard sales presentation and virtually ignored his stated concern, which is one of the steps, by the way, when I hear something I really don't want to hear, I'll frequently try pretending and acting as if I didn't hear it, and they have to bring it up again for me to react to it. And frequently they don't because it was just something a knee jerk, you know, oh, he's about to ask me to buy. Here's an objection I just came up with. Let me try this. So if you try to, if you did all those things and he still has an objection you can't handle, then and only then say, and this is the key, the, the trap door, let me be totally blunt. I just don't know the answer. But we have experts who do. In other words, you have been able to answer his objection or question, and I'll be talking with them before the day is over. I'll return tomorrow with a solution or with an admission that I can't solve it. Tell me exactly what time you want me and the solution to be here. And then have your appointment book up and your pen poised. Then shut up and write it down. 
if you're in a situation where they have to come back to you, then you alter the script accordingly. Uh, but again, you nail them down. Uh, and that listen part came from another book that I wrote from J. Douglas Edwards' teachings. It's called Sales Closing Power. And uh, where I said, listen and be quiet. Doug Edwards taught us that. He said, when you ask a closing question, I'm not going to yell in your ear over a microphone, but when you ask a closing question, shut up. He would scream like he's going to bust out the microphone. You shut up. And then he tells a story that I told him at the time I wasn't sure was true, but it made a good point. He said that he was calling on somebody. I think it was a with Ford Motor Company, not important, but whatever. He asked a closing question and he shut up. Uh, Doug shut up and the uh, gentleman shut up. I'll give you part of the punchline uh, now. Uh, he, later, the guy admitted he'd read or attended one of Doug's seminars <laughs> and knew that Doug was going to ask a closing question and shut up. He said, so I shut up. And he, Doug said, by my watch, we sat in silence for 23 minutes. And finally, he couldn't take it, and he spoke, and he bought. <laughs> 23 minutes. So, Had that been a woman on the other side, it never would have happened. You know, probably not. I, I, for, on my case, it wouldn't. I would have just said, well, see ya. I would have left. <laughs> I guess yeah. you're done. <laughs> yeah. In the deep south, I said, you have a nice day now. You're here and off I'd go. <laughs> and I wouldn't well, be looking back either. I heard one the other day that made me think of you. I asked somebody about something. I don't think I was selling. I think I was just talking to somebody. But anyway, I said, which way do you want to do it or whatever? And they said, it don't make no never mind. <laughs> and I said, you're not from the south, are you? They said, well, yeah, yeah, I was raised in Alabama. Why? Yeah. I said, it was just a shot in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I've but, actually never used that phrase, but I've heard people do it. And I'm I'm not even shocked by it. Or, or I don't have to decipher what they said. I said, oh, I get it. Yeah, you know <laughs> what they mean. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, gee, yet? Mm. I use it like, ki yeah, I use it kiddingly you know when i use mm. it i know i know it's funny i you know and i've even tried to figure it out it don't make no never mind yeah uh, it's i know exactly sense. what they mean but i yeah. couldn't explain it word for word yeah so uh, yeah so there, we have things in the south that we, and even from town to town state to state you can't just say oh the south they all talk like that no we don't we each have our own little weird thing. Like, I never say turn off the lights. I say close off the lights. Whoa. I've done that all of my life. My mother would say, where did that come from? I don't know. You raised me. <laughs> you know? Where did it come from? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there are big differences between some of my favorite cities, Charleston, Savannah, uh, lots of places in Louisiana. I'm just... Uh, in Bat I, I said Baton Rouge one day and somebody in Baton Rouge said it's Baton Rouge it's French you know and I said it's whoa all... <laughs> yeah it depends <laughs> on what side of the bridge you're on so yeah. <laughs> don't even worry it's like train tracks you yeah. know? it don't make no never mind yeah it doesn't make it yeah, or it doesn't make a lick of sense to me I use that there one there you go lick of sense yeah, yeah. And, and how that, does that that's... make any sense it, when selling uh, that's something that gives you an instant bond. If you can pick up something that you know where it came from, or you don't know where it came from, but you you find it fascinating, ask them. And they love to talk about themselves. There's a, one of the that uh, eat the pills and it's the same as eating vegetables and so the balance of nature. And oh. there's a guy in that commercial who uh, is obviously from New York, and he holds the weightlifting for, for his age group. He's in his 70s, I'm guessing. For his age group, he holds several weightlifting things. And uh, down near the end of the commercial, he says, um, I, you, you're supposed to eat this number of servings and this. And so he said, I don't have time to do all that. Forget about it. 
Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a client from Long Island, and the first couple times I spoke with him, I'd had, you know, typical New York, Long Island accent fast. And I finally said, okay, I can't hear you. <laughs> I have Southern ears. Can you slow down? And he did learn to slow down. And I got used to it after a while. But those first couple, you know, two or three conversations were painful for both of us because I literally couldn't understand what he was saying. But when selling, look for those things because people like to talk about themselves and how wonderful they are and how unique they (laughs) are and so on. And if it's forget about it or it don't make no never mind. That gives you an idea of where they're from, or it gives you the right to ask. You know, you're not from Long Island by any chance, are you? Right. Uh, right. Or Long Island is <laughs> spelled L A W N G U Y L A N D. In um, Atlanta, we don't pronounce. You know, I don't live there, but I've been there a lot. Well, you don't pronounce the T's, or I mean, there's a lot of little. Right. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you just it's Atlanta. Atlanta. It's not Atlanta. It's like <laughs> who are you? What do you say? Or my my father, when he left Alabama during the Depression, he went to work in uh, he uh, in a photo reflex store, and he said, "I was so proud to be in Louisville, Kentucky." Louisville. <laughs> yeah, he said, or a real Southerner, or a real Louisvillean, if that's a word, will say Louisville. Yeah. yeah. But he he said, "I I said Louisville once." And everybody within earshot turned on me and corrected me. So he got he got down. He wouldn't do the full Louisville, but Louisville, you know, one word. And, and Mississippi you, is not pronounced like Mississippi. It's Mississippi. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. Pay attention to us. Yeah. Come know? on now. <laughs> <laughs> we slur our consonants. You yeah. have to get used to it. <laughs> so. When selling look for those things. It gives you an opportunity to become a sales infiltrator and get inside their defenses. If, if, if you know the difference between Louisville, Kentucky and Louisville, Kentucky, you got an end. So, and you might even tell them that funny story. You know, they're from Louisville. Uh, you know, that reminds me, Ben Gay was talking about uh, when his father moved to Louisville, he thought it was Louisville, Kentucky, and they'll laugh in always. They'll laugh and say, oh, yeah, you can always tell a newcomer. You know, what brought you to Louisville? Well, this happened or I met my wife in the service or what have you. You're getting in, getting in, getting in. Your sales infil- infiltrating. You're becoming a part of their family. You're showing an interest in them. As Mary Kay used to say, and I think she got it from How to Win Friends and Influence People, or that triggered her. Uh, she said, picture everybody you meet with a sign around their neck that says, make me feel important. Mm-hmm. And I do that in selling. I do it when I, I just do it all the time with everybody. You know, but that's you, your nature. Yeah, if, well, you, it you also pays well. Trained. I know, I know it <laughs> yeah. does, but you didn't have to be trained to be something that you weren't to start with, is my point. Yeah, well, I'm from the South, raised right. by around Southern people who are, by and large, don't want to sound like a bigot, kind and gentler than some other areas of the world. Oh, when no they question. say, come over to my house and, and have a bite, they mean it. They want you to come over to their house and have a bite. Or have coffee. Uh, yeah, uh, we were visiting my sister and met one of her, by marriage, one of her aunts and uncles. And uh, Grover and Anne were their names. And uh, she said, we want you to come over and, and have a bite with us. And you know, I said, oh, that's okay. Thank you very much. No, no, I insist. And my sister looked at me over her shoulder like, just give in. It'll be easier. So we went over, and as G- and they'd only beat us to the house by maybe an hour, if that. Gigi walked in and said, my God, it's Thanksgiving. They had put out a full spread for six people. I don't know if they keep it in the six people storage locker ready to go at all times. <laughs> but uh, a full spread for stuff. six people. When she said, come over, uh, she meant it. Yeah. So when you're you're dealing with somebody, there's one of those things of 
dealing with people the way they're used to being dealt with. Southerners are different. Yankees are different. Some of it's fun, some of it's immaterial, but there yeah. is a difference. For instance, if there you is. read, my mother was a Yankee, uh, North Andover, Massachusetts. We used to kid her. All Yankee recipes start out start out with first boil the meat. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so look for the difference. Capitalize on them. Use them to show interest. And when you have that bond, you're much less likely to be hit by a two by four than anybody else because people don't beat up their friends. No, uh, you they get want to you turn. to feel comfortable. They want you right. to be successful. And if you're dealing with a Southerner, they actually want to help you. We and, do. And you get to learn something new about your new friend, your new prospect. Yep. Maybe you can't sell them or shouldn't sell them, but maybe they've got a cousin or down here, it'd be cousin, who does want that unicycle. You just don't know. Yep. Absolutely. They, they do have, I guarantee you, if they're over 30, I guarantee you they know someone who has a unicycle. Really? You may not. Yeah, you may not see it every few minutes, but it's in the garage. Maybe they're hanging clothes on it. But my point is, even a unicycle can be a point of contact um, and uh, an opportunity to tell a funny story. I would I, I haven't. But now that I'm thinking about it, I might. Somebody throws me a curveball objection. I'm going to say, let me tell you a story. A friend of mine was working at a sporting goods store. And da, 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 tell the unicycle story. And I say, your, your objection reminds me of the unicycle story. Uh, you're either messing with me uh, or you don't mean it. Uh, so explain it to me. Tell, tell me more about your what, what you just said, because I truly don't get it. And they will lower their guard and begin talking to you like a human being. And now it's a conversation, which is really where you want to go. Right. Because when you show up uh, or they show up at your place, if you're the salesperson, let me just tell you the nasty truth. Until you change the setting, you are a liar, cheat, and thief out to con them out of their money. And that's anywhere above a cashier at Walmart. When you meet somebody out on the floor, you, you really don't know if you should trust their advice either because they don't know what they're talking about or they're trying to sell you something or whatever <clears throat> so make sure your footing in the in the same chapter it teaches or mentions what uh, earl nightingale taught us in the, the strangest secret among other things he said always check your references make sure that we're on the same page that this phrase means the same thing to them that it means to you. And you'll frequently get hit by a two by four strictly because they didn't understand what you said. They didn't understand the point. We're up on an hour. I'm not supposed to be the one that says that, but we're up on an hour. We are. Um, what do we want to talk about next week, Ben? I've well, got one open. Uh, let me see. I should know because I was looking at it this morning. Oh, on page 123, handling sales rejection. 123. Have we had, whoops. Got it? Nope. <laughs> I will. Okay, it, got it. It comes right after 122. I noticed that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk to your wife. <laughs> Fortunately, she's left. So you're, I'm safe for the moment. She knows how to reach me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay, we'll talk about that. And listen, everybody, before I let you go, and we've just had one of those days where we're trying to get here, we got here, and now we're running out of time. But I don't want to run out of time without having Ben tell you where to get these books. Because when I tell you, they are a very important part of my entrepreneurial library. In fact, and I think I've said this to you before, Ben, those two, three books, you sent me the closers, one and two, and you, you sent me uh, J. Douglas Edwards' book. So that started, in my opinion, my entrepreneurial library. I had a few other books that, you know, guests and publishing houses had sent me, but I, you know, it's like, Hmm, I'd read them, but then I got to these and went, 
okay, now I need to collect. I need to have books that I can use on a regular basis that are going to move me forward. So those of you who can hear us, I'm going to ask Ben to tell you how to get those books. And I'll tell you a two or three sentence story to go with it. I, I love this. I still remember where I was when he said it to me. I was talking to someone who just gotten his books, The Closers Part One at that time. Now it goes up to five. But uh, he just got in his books and he said, Mr. Gay, he said, I started reading this book and then I got up and shut the door to my office. I didn't feel like I should be caught reading it. It gives oh. me an unfair advantage. Oh. And I thought, what a nice compliment that is. It gives you an unfair advantage. Now, obviously, the trick is don't misuse the unfair advantage. But it, it tells you things, the Closer series tells you things other people won't tell you because they're too polite or they don't know or whatever. So anyway, if you want to add, as Denise has, the Closer series, all of it, part of it, one of it, uh, go to stores, S-T-O-R-E-S, -E at uh, ebay.com forward slash Ronzoni books, all one word, R-O-N-Z-O-N-E books, B-O-O-K-S, stores at ebay.com, Ronzoni books. And there is the entire selection we offer from the Closer series, all with special pricing, all with free shipping. And although it comes from a different store, uh, they will bring them to me and I'll sign and date all of them. Now, tell us what you're up to, Denise. Oh, I am busier than a one-arm paper hanger. That's a Southern thing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm feeling very Southern today for some reason. Just a lot going on. I'm doing a lot of podcast consulting with people who want to be a podcast host or a podcast guest. And that is, you know, I finally had enough people you were one of them that said Denise teach what you know you've been doing this for so long yep. teach what you know and you finally hammered it into my head and I'm doing it and I have to say I'm loving it so if you want to reach me the best way to reach me honestly is to call my toll-free number and that is 1-888-719-6711 you can find me and Ben on LinkedIn you can find us on Facebook you can find me on your partner in success radio.com. It's impossible not to find us. So, you know, give us a call, pay attention to what we're, we're trying to do to help you here and ask us questions. We love to have questions that you send us to, to answer here on this podcast. So Ben, I will talk with you next week, next Wednesday, and I've got the 123. So we're good to go. So thank you everybody. And have a terrific week. Ben, tell Gigi hi and tell her thank you. I shall. You have a wonderful day.